Well, I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which I may say is one of the most difficult passages in the Bible. Half the world doesn't like the way it gets translated, literally. And it's not easy to translate because it's not always clear what the words mean. We'll look at that in a moment. I'm just going to read it to you from a modified version of the message uh, and then speak about it. Paul is speaking to the Corinthians and he says, It pleases me that you continue to remember and honor me by keeping up the traditions of the faith I taught you. All actual authority stems from Christ. In a marriage relationship, there is authority from Christ to husband and from husband to wife. The authority of Christ is the authority of God. Any man who speaks with God or about God in a way that shows a lack of respect for the authority of Christ dishonors Christ. In the same way, a wife who speaks with God in a way that shows a lack of respect for the authority of her husband dishonors her husband. Worse, she dishonors herself. An ugly sight, like a woman with her head shaved. This is basically the origin of these customs we have of women wearing head coverings in worship, while men uncover their heads. By these symbolic acts, men and women, who far too often butt heads with each other, submit their heads to the head, God. Don't, by the way, read too much into the differences here between men and women. Neither man nor woman can go it alone or claim priority. Man was created first as a beautiful, shining reflection of God. That is true. But the head on a woman's body clearly outshines in beauty the head of her head, her husband. The first woman came from man, true, but ever since then, every man comes from a woman. And since virtually everything comes from God anyway, let's stop going through these who's first routines. Don't you agree there is something naturally powerful in the symbolism? A woman, her beautiful hair, reminiscent of angels praying in adoration, a man, his head bared in reverence, praying in submission. I hope you're not going to be argumentative about this. All God's churches see it this way, and I don't want you standing out as an exception. Regarding this next item, I'm not at all pleased. I'm getting the picture that when you meet together, it brings out your worst side instead of your best. First, I get this report on your divisiveness, competing with and criticizing each other. I'm reluctant to believe it, but there it is. The best that can be said for it is that the testing process will bring the truth into the open and confirm it. And then I find that you bring your divisions to worship. You come together, and instead of eating the Lord's Supper, you bring in a lot of food from the outside and make pigs of yourself. Some are left out and go, I'm hungry, and others have to be carried out too drunk to walk. I can't believe it. Don't you have your own homes to eat and drink in? Why would you despise God's church? Why would you actually shame God's poor? I never would have believed you would stoop to this, and I'm not going to stand by and say nothing. Let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it's so centrally important. I received my instructions from the Lord himself and passed them on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread, and having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this to remember me. And after supper... He did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the Lord. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the Lord returns, and you must never let familiarity breed contempt. Anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord irreverently is like a part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance you want to be part of? Examine your motives. Test your heart. Come to this meal in holy awe. And if you give no thought or worse, don't care about the body when you eat and drink, you're running the risk of serious consequences. That's why so many of you even now are listless and sick and others have gone to an early grave. If we get this straight now, we won't have to be straightened out later on. Better to be confronted by the Lord now than later. So, my friends, when you come together to the Lord's table, be reverent and courteous with one another. If you're so hungry that you can't wait to be served, go home and get a sandwich. But by no means risk turning this meal into an eating and drinking binge or a family squabble. It is a spiritual meal, a love feast. And the other things you asked about, I'll respond to in person when I make my next visit. So, two sections. Men and woman and communion. So let's deal with the men and woman first. 
The context is the new freedom that these people had in Jesus, which we know from previous passages they had been abusing. And it seems like they had gone to certain extremes. There were certain customs in the Middle Eastern world of that day. One of them was that uh, women should have their heads covered, even in public, and if they didn't, uh, they would be considered as, especially in a place like Corinth or Ephesus, as prostitutes. Uh, and so he sees that some of these women are saying that when they're in the church, they can do as they please because they're equal in Jesus to everybody. So they'd done away with these customs. And so they'd come into church and they'd begun to really strut their equality and in some cases to lord it over the men. And uh, that's never a good thing because it upsets the balance of society, it upsets the home, and it still happens today in the sense that there are women who are maybe people who've known Jesus for a long time and they marry some guy and he's really a, a good guy. He doesn't know Jesus and later on he comes to know Jesus, but when he comes to church, he's like his wife knows everything. And she makes sure that he knows it. And everybody can see that she's the really spiritual one. And that's no way to actually help a family grow or a marriage grow or the church grow. It creates huge complications. So Paul is talking here about headship. And he's saying, listen, the whole thing here is that when you worship God, you've got to give God the glory in your gathering together. And this is going to have implications for the way you relate to one another and the way you come to worship, and who you draw attention to. Because these ladies were drawing attention to themselves. So that's the context. And as we look at this whole thing, I need to say at the beginning that this is not about an inferior or superior thing. They're equal. It's very clear. He says that, uh, you know, Jesus... Uh, submits to the Father as his head. That doesn't mean that he's not equally God. He is equal, but there's a voluntary submission. And in the same way, a woman is not in any way inferior to the man, but she submits voluntarily to his headship. Now the big argument that has been with translators, which is still there, is how do you interpret the word head? Kephale in Greek. Well, most people say head. This part of you. 12 inches above your shoulders or whatever. That's the head. And certainly there's a literal sense of the head, but there's also a figurative sense. And some people have said, well, we shouldn't really uh, see this just as talking about your head, who you are as a person. But there's a whole thing here about um, a figurative thing, that somebody is supreme over you or you're responsible to them or they're your source. And there's quite a lot of people who really say that's how you tr should translate it. And certainly the, I think there is a figurative sense um, of some kind um, of being responsible to someone. But again, the head is the person who determines the love and truth that exists in the body, in the community of God's people. That's what the head does. There's a great responsibility as far as the head is concerned. So there's a responsibility for and a responsibility to. So these things are very clearly there when it talks about uh, the man and the woman, um, and the head of the man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. Now, I don't like, no, the ladies don't like to hear that. So we have to ask our question, and the first question is, why should there be a head at all? And if there is, why should it be a man? Right, ladies? Well, you have to go back to Genesis. Now, you all know John 3.16, right? Right? For God so loved the world. Do you know Genesis 3.16? Genesis 3.16 is God saying, because of what's happened, I have to institute an order for a fallen world, which Jesus will come and begin to undo and which won't be there uh, in the new creation. And Genesis 3.16, apart from saying that woman will uh, suffer in childbirth, which obviously wouldn't have been the case in God's intention before, says to the lady, you, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Structure for a fallen world. Now, why do we need a structure for a fallen world? Because in the biblical idea of marriage, and we're talking about Adam and Eve as a married couple, and we're talking here on the implication of married couples particularly, somebody has to be the head. 
Because much as you love each other, down the road there's going to be a decision in which you have equally powerful arguments, but someone has to decide and take the responsibility for that decision. When you've got two people, you cannot have a democracy. Sorry, ladies. And sorry, guys, but if you make the decision, you're answerable for it. And your wife is perfectly right to say, I told you you should have listened to me. <laughs> but you make the decision, and it's, it's right for the wife to say, well, there's a stalemate here. You have to make the decision. There needs to be an order. Why? Because marriage is permanent, and one or other party in the last resort must have the power to decide family policy. And God says that should be the man. Not because he's better, because that's the God-given order for the society that we live in. So as we think about that, the second question is, what about this whole thing of hats? Now I want to say, first of all, there is no word hats in the Greek. Okay? None. There's only one place where there is a word which can be uh, actually translated veil. It's a slightly different word from, from covering. Uh, and that's in verse 15. And that says that a woman's long hair is given to her instead of a veil. So let's do away with hats and let's do away with veils. Because people have made a huge thing of this. And uh, Deanna will remember years ago in one of our previous churches, we were very friendly with a local Dormini, a young guy. And we got on very well with him. But he said, oh, he said, you know, it's this hat thing. It's so stressful for my poor wife. Because she's got to wear a hat to church, but she can't keep wearing the same hat. So I said, so what do you guys do about it? She said, these women are clever, you know, in Afrikaans. She said, she and all her friends got together. Now they have a ring. And each month they send a hat to the next person and they get a new hat. So that's how they dealt with it. But you see, the problem there was, what was the hat doing? It wasn't drawing attention to anything like submission to authority. It was drawing attention to the person. And so Paul is saying here, listen, there's certain things in the natural order of things that actually you should see a difference between men and women when you go in to worship. Because some people were saying, you know what, we're equal in Jesus. There's no difference between men and women. I beg to differ, and I'm very glad that there's a difference between men and women. And I like that translation, that, uh, you know, the beauty of a man's glory is much better than his beauty. That's his wife. Because that's how it should be. But no hats not even any veils. So what is he saying? He's saying, understand something. Man is made in the image of God and is, therefore God is his glory. And so as we look at men and as we look at what they like, he's the glory of God because he's made in the image of God. And so he should reflect the glory of God in worship. So therefore, his head should be uncovered. People should see the glory of God in the way that he worships. Unlike people who say, well, let's have unisex, we're all the same, there's no difference between men and women. There is a difference, and it should be visible, and it should be obvious to everybody, who the men and who the women. The form is debatable, okay? Paul is saying, well, generally men have shorter hair. In fact, when you read about it, it doesn't actually talk about short. It says men shouldn't adorn their hair. So guys with fancy hairdos, that's for you. Women should adorn their hair. It's their glory. So, if man is the glory of God, when you're worshipping, you should see the glory of God. Men should uncover their heads. Okay? But if woman is the glory of man, she doesn't want to draw attention to man when you're worshipping God. Right? She wants to draw attention to God. So, therefore, she should cover her glory. And there's debate about this. Should she then wear a covering? Please, not one of those fancy lace mantilla veil things. That's not in the Bible. There are places in Spain where they have competitions for the fanciest one. That's how bad it gets, you know, ladies. When it comes to dressing up, they can find anything to compete with. It's really to say that the way that you operate in church should obviously point away from you and towards God. So you shouldn't be drawing attention to yourself as the glory of man. You should be putting attention on the glory of God. That's what this whole covering thing is all about. It's how you come and what your attitude is. It's not necessarily how you dress. It's been brought down to that, and there were customs in those days, and Paul was saying these are the customs, so we fit in with them because if you violate them, people are going to get the wrong idea. If you behave like that, they'll think you're the wrong kind of person. So you need to be aware of that because we're the alternative society. We had to show people what God is really like. We're not trying to break that down. 
We're not trying to give a skewed version of that. And when we get together, ladies, people should obviously see that the attention is on God, not on you. Your relationship with your husband should reflect that. And men, your relationship with your wife should reflect the fact that you really love God and therefore you really love her the way Jesus loves her. If those things aren't there, you can dress up as much as you like. You can cover your heads. And by the way, for teenagers, I don't think hats are the problem. I think hoodies are the problem. And I think it's disrespectful. And let's, those guys who were in the army will know what happens when you pray. What do they say? Off. Hats off in English. And we've noticed something praying in the street, especially uh, with the colored guys. They wear hats. Most white guys don't. But boy, when you say, let us pray, the first thing is, and it's a sign of respect. And you can see it. It's not just a thing. There really is a deep respect there. And what they're doing in that simple action is saying, no. And I would say that the same thing would apply if, if, if your clothing in any way detracts from respect for God. Think about it, you know? Now you might say, oh, well, you know, I don't have a problem with the head or with a hat or anything like that. I'm really in submission to my husband. Just make sure that your whole demeanor reflects that. So that's the, the first part of this chapter. And what we're saying here is in God's presence, we're going to give God the glory. That's what we want to do. In the way we dress, in the way we behave, in everything that we do. And there is an order, and that order is simply this. Men are responsible to lead. Because this is not about ministry. Because notice that Paul is saying when a woman prophesies or prays in public, which means she can do that, so she can minister. That's perfectly in order. Uh, but he's not saying when she leads. So there will be a lot of arguments about that, and I know there are very strong viewpoints here, but I think it's fairly clear that Paul uh, and the basic teaching of the New Testament is men are responsible to lead, and they should not abdicate that responsibility. And I'm all for men following Jesus and living like Jesus and being able to say like Paul did at the beginning of this chapter, imitate me because I imitate Jesus. And men, you're responsible. And if things are wrong on a spiritual side, you are the one that God holds accountable first. So men are responsible for leadership to give the lead. That's not to boss, to order around, to be superior, or anything like that. It's to give the lead to show Jesus in the church and amongst God's people. And women, although they're equal or they have an equal ministry, sometimes a more powerful ministry, are responsible to acknowledge that and say, yes, I will acknowledge that. Because, you know, when you get a lot of intercessors together, which are often women, you know what? Because God answers their prayer powerfully, often they want to have more say in the way that the church is going. And that's not what your gifting is supposed to do. Your gifting is supposed to build the body and hear what God is saying to the church and the leaders are responsible to hear from God. So I'm going to leave that with you very quiet. The guys are too scared to say amen and the ladies are not sure what to do now. Well, let me just encourage you. God has gifted you and God has blessed you and you're part of the body and that's what Jesus wants you to know. Just see that God has got to give an order. That's all it is. And Paul is saying, you know, don't get in a stew about this. Just say, thank you, God, that ultimately he's responsible, not me. Right? Otherwise, you can come here. Steve will tell you that when it comes to the hard decisions, do you want to be up here, Steve? <laughs> Sometimes you just have to do what has to be done. So we're equal. But we fit in with God's order of things. So that's the first bit. Okay, done? Any questions? Seriously? You can ask me afterwards. Okay, now what about communion? Because we're going to share in a moment. And Paul is talking about the fact that this church is really messed up. It's messed up in its relationships with men and women. It's, they've got the wrong end about their liberty and their freedom. And they've got the wrong end too in terms of the Lord's Supper, and what became as a celebrate, what started as a celebration of what God had done for them just became a party, and a party just became a drunken party, and the rich people just brought lots of food, and the poor people had nothing, and we were in a church years ago, which was a country church, and because it was a country church, and it was all farmers, they had what was a very nice thing, once a month, 
They had big church day, as they called it. So you would have an early morning service. The, there was just this church in the farming community. There was no village or anything. And you'd have a service, and then you would have tea, uh, and then um, the, the, there would be a, just a short sort of thing, and then you would have tea, and then uh, you'd have the main service, and then you'd all have lunch together. But different farmers had responsibilities to look after the domini, the pastor. So what used to happen is that uh, some of them really laid on a spread, and some of them were really poor, and they couldn't do that. And there was a danger of this kind of thing creeping in, the people comparing, and some people doing without. Instead of putting it all on one table and saying, everybody, let's share, they made different little groups and they brought division in, which was very sad because it was a wonderful idea and a wonderful time to get together. And then the division went further because then the men would sit and smoke their pipes and talk and whatever they did, and the ladies would go and have their meeting. And then they'd have an afternoon service. It was a whole day. A lot of them were farmers. They could only come once a month. But it had great potential for blessing, but it had great potential which began to creep towards the fact that we are divided here. Some of us are better off than others. And we've got to be careful when we come together that we concentrate on what Jesus has done because if we're going to give glory in the way uh, that we worship and we share together and we fit in with God's order, we've got to do it too in the way that we have communion. And Paul says you've got to give glory to Jesus. This is about Jesus. And I just want to clear up one phrase here. When Jesus talks about being worthy of communion, he doesn't mean that you are worthy to have communion, but you partake in a worthy manner, which is a very different thing altogether. In other words, because of Jesus, we're all worthy. We're all free to come. None of us could come anyway if it wasn't for Jesus. It's Jesus who just welcomes that in, and it doesn't matter what we've done or who we are. He says, come and receive. Come and be blessed by what I've done for you. And remember that. But when you come and you partake, do it in a way which reflects what Jesus has done. Do it in a worthy manner. So we always look back. We look to what Jesus did. And we always, as we look back to what Jesus has done, we also look uh, inside us so that we know that we're coming for the right reasons. There should be nothing holding us back from coming and having communion because Jesus has taken away all those barriers. We're not coming to show off to people. We're not coming because this is the done thing. We're coming because we want to meet with Jesus in a particular way. And we look around us at the people of God and we thank God for who they are and we look forward to what Jesus is going to do ultimately one day. So all of those things are wrapped up as the people of God. So we keep reminding ourselves of two things. Everything Jesus has done for us and everything Jesus is still doing for us and will keep on doing for us. It's not just a past thing. It's what's happening now as well as what happened on the cross. And when we look at the bread and we look at the, the cup, which is, represents the blood of Jesus, um, Paul Brand wrote a very interesting thing about that. He, he, he looked at the things that were in the Bible and he looked at the body and he said, well, when you look at the bread, what you have to understand is the body of Jesus was broken to make you whole. So when you take that bread, there's healing there. If you're not well or you're suffering in some way physically, you can expect healing to come by faith as you eat the bread. Because that's what Jesus did. He wanted to bring you wholeness. And Jesus also said again and again, I am the living bread. Didn't he say that? I'm the bread of life. So therefore, when you take the bread, you can expect Jesus to sustain you and nourish you. So if you're feeling malnourished spiritually and hungry spiritually, just simply doing that, Jesus is going to nourish you and strengthen you and satisfy that hunger. And the third thing is that Paul again and again says we partake of the one loaf. There's one bread that was broken. And so what the bread does is it brings unity. And you look around and say, God, I'm not alone. We are one. Thank you that we are one. And you thank God for that and you enjoy being part of his community. Now what about the blood? Well, the shed blood poured out for us when Jesus died. Uh, has the implication of cleansing and forgiveness and setting us free. 
So you can expect that when you drink the cup. If you need cleansing, Jesus will cleanse you. If you need forgiveness, he'll forgive you and give you a new beginning. If you need to be set free in some way, that's what the blood of Jesus does. Then if you think about blood and you think of how blood works, one of the things, there's a phrase uh, in the Old Testament which comes through to the New Testament, that the life is in the blood, which is why they didn't drink the blood, which is why it was such a thing when Jesus said, drink this cup, it's my blood. What people were astonished by that. But what he was trying to say to them is, listen, understand, what does your blood do? It energizes you. If you're anemic or you lose a lot of blood, you get weak. Without blood, you can't work. In fact, without blood, you die. It's the blood coursing through your veins. That is your life. And Jesus says, when you take that cup, I give you life. I energize you. That's what will happen. And the other thing is, think about your blood as part of your immune system. Within your blood is your whole history of immunity. So that when your body is attacked by anything, there is an immune system which will recognize those uh, foreign cells and will attack them. And maybe with uh, the immunity that's already there from previous attacks will help you to overcome any attack by something outside of you. And you know, uh, we read that they overcome him by their word of their testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. And so the blood of Jesus helps you to defeat the enemy and to overcome him. And think about this. You get immunity from your mother when you're born. It's in the blood. Right? Jesus, when you're reborn, gives you his immunity to a certain sense. What did Jesus do when he was attacked? He resisted temptation. There's something there. And so when you understand what Jesus has done, you're able to say, Jesus, you said you would help me overcome the enemy. You said that you would show me a way out when I'm tempted. And that's part of what the blood does. So I can expect your help in that. So those are just some of the things that are there. Now, before we share in and we take communion together, what does he mean about recognizing the body and not drinking judgment on ourselves? Well, in the original, oldest manuscripts, it doesn't say the body of the Lord, okay? Because the natural thing is we recognize the body of the Lord, what Jesus has done for us. But if you talk about discerning the body, that means that looking around at one another is really important. Because otherwise we eat judgment on ourselves. How do we do that? Is God going to punish us for not caring for each other? Well, think of the logical consequences. If we look at the body, and won't you just do that now? If necessary, turn your head right around on your shoulders like an owl and look at the people around you. And discern the body and ask yourself, as I come to the Lord's table, am I aware that I, there are people here who are on need, who may need prayer or a word from you, and I am to discern the body and give them that. Because if we do not pray for each other, we forfeit all the blessings of healing prayer, right? That's why some are sick and some go to an early grave. Isn't that what the New Testament says? If people are sick, pray for them so they can get well. Well, an obvious thing and an obvious time to do that is when we remember what Jesus did for us and we discern the body. So that's one way of discerning the body. It's not just looking at everything Jesus did and what the bread and the cup means. It's looking at each other and saying, you know what? We really want to function as the body of Jesus so that we don't have the consequences of inaction and of not discerning the body, which means that some people are going to suffer unnecessarily and you and I could have made a difference. Does that make sense to you? And he says, rather let God, you know, sensitize you now and sort this out now so that it doesn't become an issue later. Now I know there are other ways that... You can explain that passage, and they're perfectly valid. Uh, and a lot of people will really say, listen, you've really got to get right with God because you know, God's going to discipline you, and this is part of discipline. That's fine, but I really want to concentrate on the plain thing here, which is discern the body. So, now, we're going to share together. And one of the things is we show courtesy to each other, and we help each other 
And what we do is we really remember what Jesus has done by this simple action of taking the bread and the cup. We say again to ourselves and to everyone around us, look at what Jesus has done for us. Look at what Jesus is doing for us. Look at what there is to expect down the road. And we rejoice in that. So that's what we're going to do. I asked the elders if they will help me, so they're going to come forward. Uh, the worship team are going to also come. And while we do this, just ask Jesus to make real to you everything he's done for you. So the worship team will come, and when we give them, we'll give them communion first, so whoever goes will go to them first. We thank you for this day. We thank you for everything you've done for us. We glorify you, Lord Jesus. And as we come and we have met with you this morning, you've met with us. Now be made real to us in a special way as we take the bread and the cup. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand, please? Father, we thank you for Jesus who shows us everything that we should be in you and gives us everything that we need in you and is always with us. I pray for each man here, Lord, that you would affirm in them the desire to show the lead in following Jesus and strengthen them in that. I pray for every woman that she would enjoy what she has in Jesus. And I pray your love upon all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. We are here to pray for you if you need prayer. And I would suggest, men, that if you're here with your lady, that before you go, you just say, thank you, Lord, and you pray a blessing on her and say, thank you, Jesus, for this woman. Bless her. Okay? Thank you. God bless you.